Now, joining me on the couch today is a world-renowned Santur player. And if right now you're scratching your head a little bit and trying to think, what is the Santur? What's that sound? You're not alone. Don't worry. And we figured you wouldn't be alone. So before I introduce our guest, let me just give you a quick musical snippet of what the instrument sounds like. Now you've got your musical context in place, although what's happening in Cape Town tomorrow night is a little different from that. At least you've got the broad picture. That was a clip of Rahul Sharma playing the Santur in a piece called Destinations, the Instrumental Odyssey. Now tomorrow evening he will be joining forces with the Cape Town Philharmonic Orchestra for a concert called Symp- Symphony of Santur. Sympathy of Santur, sorry, <laughs> blending the rich traditions of Indian and Western music. Sorry, I'm ch- no, stumbling on my own words there, Rahul. It's lovely to have you back thank in you Cape so much, Town. Brother. I know it's not thanks your first visit. And thanks for joining us here. Sympathy of Santa. Um, before we talk about what's happening tomorrow night, though, let's just talk a bit about your, your background because right. from the story, it looks like this is something you were born to do. You've come from a long line of Santa players, but I believe you actually came to it relatively late. I, I began pretty late and I started learning from my father and guru, mm-hmm. uh, Pandit Shiv Kumar Sharma, who is the pioneer of this instrument. Now, the Santur belongs to a valley in Kashmir, and uh, it was a little-known instrument until my father introduced it into Indian classical music okay. and gave it that stature. So, well, yeah, I had a guru at home. I was very fortunate, and mm-hmm. it started from there. I started around 11 or 12, which is late compared to other kids of musicians who start really when they're born. Mm. So it was much later, but uh, it became uh, a way of expressing myself and just an extension of my personality and uh, apart from Indian classical then I dabbled in uh, you know jazz and uh, fusion and electronica Mm -hmm. and what I'm here for uh, the Cape Town Orchestra tomorrow so it's been an interesting journey so far. It's I can't help comparing as I chat to you. A week or two ago, I had the cellist Yo-Yo Ma sitting, uh, talking to me, and he told wow. me how he'd started playing the cello at the age of four. Right. You and you start in your early teens, and it's an instrument with a hundred strings. Yes. How long does it actually take to master? It takes a long time to tune. Is that <laughs> what I can tell you? <laughs> But uh, it it's a lifetime uh, of effort and you continue uh, learning. And because especially with not just the 100 string instrument, the whole system of learning the Indian classical music, which has ragas, and there are hundreds of ragas. Now, a raga is an ascending scale mm-hmm. of uh, notes and permutations and combinations, which would differ from another raga. So there are so many of these and it's complicated. But uh, yeah, the process is still going on. As a student, I still learn from my father. And that process never ends. Mm. So, uh, and then it's up to what you experience, what you visualize, what uh, your creativity is. And with the instrument, uh, you can push the limits and, you know, whatever you can do with it, that's that's up to an artist, I feel. Hmm. So the Small Valley in, in Kashmir, do we know much about its history? I mean, you, you've spoken to us about the mainstreaming of the instrument. Mm-hmm. Do we know how yes. far it dates back, who, who first yes. played around and made the first well, one? Well, the ancient name for this instrument was, in the Sanskrit language, the Shatatantri Veena. Now, the Shatatantri means 100 strings, and the Veena was one of the oldest instruments uh, which was played. So okay. it's mentioned in the Vedas, in the holy books, in the scriptures about this instrument. And then uh, during the Persian influence in India, the name Santur came about. Okay. And that's the reason you also find it in Iran. It's called the Iranian Santur. And in Greece, it's called the Santuri. Oh, and nice. uh, Romania, it's the Cymbalon. In Germany, it's the Hak Breath. And in America, it's the Hammer Dulcimer. So it's the same instrument in different versions, which is found. But only in Indian classical music, you have the santur, uh, which has kind of gone into that depth and uh, expresses the ragas and everything. My understanding from the bit of research I've done this morning is that 
a lot of the the craft of playing the santur rests within the artist, not only in their mastery of the instrument, but in their ability to improvise with the instrument. That there's a lot of right. sort of unscripted uh, yes. work going on. Yes. Can you tell us a little bit about how, how so that? So what works? happens in a concert, for instance, for tomorrow? What I'll will be doing in the beginning is a pure classical piece, mm -hmm. and now that there's no notation for that, so it's all in the mind, uh, okay. and we're playing a particular time cycle of let's say. Uh, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. This is called a rupak tal. Within that, we improvise. And we come back to that first beat. Mm -hmm. That's what's happening, uh, which the audience may not realize. But we are keeping that tempo. And I have an accompanist on tabla. So he is keeping that in mind where the first beat is. And within that, we improvise and we come back. Also keeping in mind the raga and its purity not breaking away from it. Similar to jazz, but in jazz, they take off to different scales. Here, mm. we, we don't do that. We, we maintain that, and we're keeping the time cycle as well. So, and then it builds up and ends in a crescendo. But it's a lot of uh, training before you come on stage, all that kind of thing. So it's, I would say, a system where your guru listens to you and then realizes, okay, I think he's fit for stage now. Before that, he's not allowed to go out and perform. So it's really? one of those kind of things, you know. I love that idea of, of the structure and the form being there, but the space to be creative and, yes. and to let yourself sort of flow with the nature of the event you're playing at. I mean, how... how how much do you plan? I mean, it's improvisation, so it's not planned. But when you go out, d does the way the audience is responding impact the way the music goes or the way you might yes, respond? Yes, it, it does that as well. But but we do have a certain uh, periphery of what we're planning to play. Mm -hmm. But the core matter, I guess, the audience definitely helps in inspiring at times. And, uh, you know, uh, when you feel the pulse of the audience, uh, you, you get more inspired and take it to another level. Yeah. Now, as you mentioned, I mean, you have taken Santur and, and combined it with all kinds of different musicians and musical styles. I mean, I've, I've, when I was looking and listening to clips beforehand, I found everything from you playing with Deep Forest to Richard Clayderman. It's a Philharmonic Orchestra tomorrow night. Talk to us about um, how you adapt the Indian style to fit a very Western style of yeah. music. That's interesting. So so the way, uh, the only way that I thought I can do it is if I compose my own music and have... Uh, the people who I'm collaborating with play my music, mm -hmm. so uh, my composition. So even with Kenny G, uh, who's not used to this Indian style, I composed the entire album, which we did together. Yep. And so he knew that where he needs to come in. And I was comfortable because I knew that the Santur would be highlighted in this, in, in this manner. So I'll, I compose my own music, and that kind of helps me in my collaborations. Okay. Yeah. For those who might have joined us late to the conversation, my guest in studio is Rahul Sharma, a Santua player born in Mumbai, India, uh, born into a family of players who taught him the craft of a hundred strings. And uh, we'll be sharing that tomorrow night with the Cape Town Philharmonic Orchestra in uh, a, a very, very special concert called the Symphony of Santua. Now, um, it's not just about classical music. Uh, Rahul, you're also in the first half of that program, I believe, going to be playing some some folk music and jazz and blues. Tell yes. us a bit more. So, so the first half uh, actually is the classical. And once I'm done with that, then we move into the jazz. We move into some of the world uh, music, some of my uh, collaborations, which I've done with Clayderman, with Kenny G. Mm -hmm. we, we play that with the symphony. And there is. it starts off with a very special f uh, piece, which is called Ahimsa. Uh, which means non-violence. Mm. And, uh, you know, the fact that Mahatma Gandhi uh, was in South Africa in his formative years, and a lot, he saw a lot, yeah. and, you know, his ethics were kind of formed by that. So the first piece is called Ahimsa, which is non-violence, and uh, the fact that music is a universal language, and uh, it just talks about peace and handling situations uh, in, uh, you know, non-violent ways. So that piece itself is Ahimsa or Satyagraha, and uh, we start off with that and then move on into the contemporary stuff. A piece like that is so needed in the city right now. Uh, yes. You've been listening to yes. the news headlines as you came it's in today. That is, that is beautiful. I know you've, you've had a passion for, for making traditional folk music more publicly uh, well-known and reviving some of the sort of uh, folk traditions through your music. Talk mm -hmm. to us a little bit about how successful you feel you've been at that. Um, so I feel that uh, a lot of the people were unaware of the folk of that region. And mm. once I kind of collaborated with certain international musicians, uh, that was highlighted. 
and although the santoor uh, you know is very reminiscent of uh, let's say waterfalls uh, romance and uh, uh, peace and that kind of stuff th- the natural tonal quality is not overbearing of that instrument mm-hmm. so uh, they're not really surprised when i play a pahari a pahari means of uh, a mountain folk but at the same time when i play the same instrument in a jazz style that's what surprises them yeah that how did this happen you know so it's about uh, uh, surprising the audience with all of that and that's what i do back home in india when i'm playing and uh, audiences kind of seem to like that because they don't hear much of that but when i travel abroad uh it's it's a mix of everything mm-hmm. it's a mix of the folk the indian classical because that's what this audience would relate more to but we give them a glimpse of other aspects as well It sounds absolutely phenomenal. I can't wait uh, to hear the outcome as you uh, uh, pair up with, uh, as I mentioned, the Cape Town Philharmonic Orchestra under the baton of Brandon Phillips for what sounds like an absolutely magical concert. Let me just mention that some extra tickets have been made available because uh, I believe the first batch sold out so quickly that additional seating has now been opened up. So there are tickets available uh, through CompuTicket with prices starting from 150 rand. Uh, the com- concert is the Symphony of Santa. I'm sorry, my autocorrect <laughs> messed with my brain in my introduction. There, the Symphony of Santur. It is happening at the Artscape Opera House tomorrow evening, Friday, the 21st of February. Uh, tickets available through CompuTicket. And uh, you've been listening to the guest performer, Raul Sharma. It's been lovely to have you with us in studio. Thank you, so Thank much, you for Peppa. bringing this wonderful Thank collaboration you. to Cape Town. It's my pleasure. Thank you. Thank you.